Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. No matter where you seeing us from. Oh, I hear the gong twice. Good morning, good <laughs> afternoon, and good evening. No um, sorry, I, ha I, I have a problem here, technical problem. Now I'm back. I had the YouTube running in the background, which is lesson number one you should learn when you do a live stream. Don't monitor on the same computer. Anyhow, my name is Matthias Röder. I'm really happy uh, to welcome you all to day two of the Karaya Music Tech Conference. Today we'll hear about spaces for music, about music networks and networks for music, and also about immersed audiences and immersed experiences. So. Um, one new thing this year is that we're offering an unconferencing session for the members of our brain trust so if you are on our slack channel um, join us tonight at 7 pm central european time for our first unconferencing session now with that i want to invite bas grasmeyer on stage who's the host for the first panel hi bas how are you doing hi matthias i'm doing well um, you know, you and I, we had uh, a lot of fun preparing the program for the conference. I just wanted to acknowledge um, all of the hard work you put into this. Um, it was a really, really fun two weeks to get it all together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's been really fun. Um, I actually haven't attended Korean Music Tech in person. I think my first one was last year's um, live streaming session, but I knew about it before and especially last year. Uh, it was so interesting to see like the panels that you know, like that were put together. Um, so it was like a big honor to to be able to like work on this. And actually, the panel that we're about to have right now was one of the first uh, things I added to the program because I think it's such an important topic. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to now uh, stepping off the stage and enjoying your conversation. So take it away, Bas. Thank you. Uh, great, like thanks, thanks everyone for tuning in already, or if you're watching this later, thanks for uh, tuning in, you know, in the future. Um, so in that case, we're speaking from the past about music spaces uh, and how music needs physical space. Um, because of the pandemic, I think a lot of the discussion around music has shifted to uh, talking about digital music, music online, live streams, very much what we're doing right now. Um, but through this panel, we want to talk about why local space, local spaces are so important for music ecosystems, whether that's kind of on a city level or actually like one very specific uh, room or um, uh, venue or something like that. Um, so we're going to be discussing that um, with a set of like amazing experts. Um, we have uh, on the stream with me, uh, Pat Rosbitska, um, uh, a professor at Aston University in Birmingham and um, founder of the Birmingham Live Music Project. I'll get to everyone in person so that you can introduce yourselves and um, maybe say your name correctly. Uh, as well as um, explain what your projects are about. So I have Astrid Exner of uh, VOK in Vienna. It's um, it's a beautiful like cultural center. I have uh, Lukas Knoflach of Sound Diplomacy and uh, based in Berlin, and Ellie Bryant uh, of the Halley in London, which is a co-working space. Um, I. I think Lucas is on black right now. So we're going to start with Pat. We'll just go for the order of, um, of how I introduced you before. Um, Pat, thank you so much for joining us. Um, do you mind explaining a little bit? Uh, you know, you're a professor. You have a certain field of study. Um, what is that? What do you specialize in? Okay. And what is the Birmingham Live Music Project? Good. So thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, my name is Patricia, but everyone calls me Pat. Um, I'm a lecturer, actually, interesting enough, in politics and international relations at Aston University. But my specialization is regulation around live music, both in the UK and on the European market. And um, based on that, I actually co-founded Birmingham Live Music Project, which basically focuses on the live music industry in the city, its population ecology, and how that is affected by various shifts, regulations, including Brexit and COVID. So in that sense, um, 
oddly enough, COVID for us was a very important element of the project. And that's our main focus. So the impact of COVID, Brexit and other regulations on live music ecology in the city. Thank you. Um, looking forward to talking about that more. Um, Astrid, can you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and uh, Veoka? Am I saying that correctly? Uh, yeah, kind of. It's actually we're just pronouncing it VUK, so uh, just oh. all in one. So <laughs> uh, VUK stands for Werkstätten und Kulturhaus, which means workshops and culture house. And it's one of the largest cultural centers in Europe. It houses a concert stage, of course, uh, but also performance, children's culture, a gallery, another gallery, uh, workshops, uh, schools, and, uh, and many more things. And um, me, I'm the, I'm the director of communications at WUC. And I'm also um, doing all the, re uh, I, I'm announcing all the rescheduled concerts, which is, uh, Kind of a, a try and an annoying thing to do at this uh, at this in this pandemic, but otherwise my job is very fun and uh, okay. is a, as you said a very nice place uh, to go to and to work at. Great, uh, uh, Lucas. Um, over to you. Good that we can see you right now on the stream. Um, yeah, mind telling me a little bit about yourself and sound diplomacy. Yeah, um, so hello everyone, my name is Lucas. I'm the Managing Director of Sound Diplomacy in Berlin. I'm responsible for um, the German-speaking countries and also our engagement on an EU level. Um, so uh, to give you a bit of an idea of what we do, we work with cities and governments on um, music policy and nighttime economy, uh, nighttime, nighttime economy policy. Um, and so when we when we talk about music, we specifically look at the music ecosystem, um, you know, looking at not only just, you know, for example, music industry or um, music education, but just looking how from a holistic perspective, how these things interact and obviously physical spaces um, are a big part of that. Um, so, you know, helping um, cities and, and governments figure out how they can create better kind of frameworks to support um, the physical spaces, for example. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what what we do. Right, and um, I'm really happy to, to have sound diplomacy on the panel because um, I think, you know, when the, when the topic came up, like the first thing, um, when someone is familiar with sound diplomacy, uh, it, the first thing you think of is sound diplomacy because um, you guys are like really thought leaders in that space, produce a lot of reports, do a lot of um, connecting of, of other thought leaders and um, and events where, where people are speaking about topics like we are today. Um, so I kind of highly recommend, maybe I should say this at the end of the panel, to, to have a look at sound diplomacy uh, specifically, if if this is like a topic that's um, that you're passionate about or interested in if you're watching the stream. Thank you for the flowers. <laughs> Uh, Ellie, um, I'm really happy also to have the, ha the Halley on um, for the reason that it's it's a physical space, but it's born from a brand that I primarily know as a digital music company. Uh, do you mind explaining a little bit what the Halley is and uh, how it got started? Sure. So I'm the general manager of the Halley and the Halley is a physical space in Haggerston in East London and we're a new space we opened up during the pandemic last summer. So we are a shared workspace with a cafe, event space and five isolated music studios. So the Halley was born out of the concept of creating a music focused space for people working in and around the music industry to come to have a place to work, create and collaborate. And Baz is right, the Halley comes from AEI Group, which is a company which has been around for many years. And predominantly, they work in kind of online communities. They're a media company, they release music, they're an event company. We had a really large online community. And the next step was let's create a physical space to push this forward and bring more people into this online community, therefore creating a physical community. So it's kind of verging between the online and physical community elements. So um, we've now done all the introductions. So we can 
kick the panel off properly. Um, and I'll, I want to stay with you, Ali. Um, I'm really curious about um, the vision behind Ali in terms of bringing, um, you mentioned people in music and people adjacent to music or working adjacent to music uh, together. Like, so one, you're doing that physically. Um, what's the what's the vision? How do you, do you imagine that? And um, it might be hard to answer actually in the context of a pandemic. Yeah. Um, like how, maybe also how has that changed things uh, at least up until this point? So um, I think that what's really important about creatives and people within the music industry and making music is that there's only so much that you can do kind of online and um, the power of community is really important uh, when we're creating this space. So in relation to what's been happening in the pandemic, um, we kind of went into this thinking we were going to have quite a fixed membership with more long-term leases. But what we realize now is that people need flexibility and we've built the Halley model um, so that people can be as, as productive as they, they need to be. So we offer complete flexibility in relation to what we see as the future of work. So that means you know less time commuting, more balance, more creative time. The facilities here are available as and when you need, so there's no commitment. So you can come in, have a meeting, use the studio, spend half a day at your desk, go to one of our events, and it's all in that very kind of concentrated physical space where you don't need to come every day, and there are some days where working from home is okay and being online is okay, but there are some days where you need to be with someone, you need to go into that studio and mix that track or put down that track or record something, or you want to go and have that conversation with a colleague. And it's the Halley is born out of the vision that we are creating that physical community where people can come together and do that. But what I'd also say is the long-term vision of the Halley is we want to build that into an online community, drawing lots of people, not just in East London, but we're starting by creating it here, right here. You mentioned something um, in terms of reducing the, the commute. I think this is a very timely topic, uh, something people are very aware of now in, in a time where people are commuting a lot less. Um, and I know um, Sound Diplomacy has, or like the C, or like founder um, Shane Shapiro has been writing about uh, the 10 minute music city, which is based on a concept of the 10 minute city, um, where I think, well, actually, I want to hand it over to Lucas because I believe you'll be much more eloquent about this particular topic than I am uh, in terms of paraphrasing it and um, adding what it means to music. Yeah, I mean, I can I can talk a little bit about it. Um, it's the as far as I know, it's the fifteen minute city, but in the end, it's ah. it's it's the same concept or the same idea behind it. But it's a concept um, which I think comes from Paris. Um, which describes having, you know, your most of your the space spaces you require, um, or like the the things you require, meaning like for some housing, office, restaurants, parks, um, hospitals, venues within like a fifteen minute proximity um, of your um, re of your residence, um, which reduces traveling um and um just gives gives also people more more time um that's that's basically it yeah and then um yeah and then what i've seen uh coming from your team actually maybe not directly you is um adding to that concept or making really uh clear like music needs to be like embedded in this 15 minute city um, can you speak a little bit about that, about like when you work with, for instance, a municipality or like a local government, um, how do you explore these these topics in terms of making sure people have, um, you know, access or exposure to music and culture in their like uh, environments, residential environments? I mean, it, it really takes a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a mindset that needs to be understood and it, it impacts, it's, it's part of, you know, the role of how we view culture and music as part of the kind of cities or places that we want to live in. Um, and specifically when you look at music, I mean, music is loud, music spaces need insulation, they need um, certain, or have certain requirements. 
And so often it's also, you know, for example, the nighttime economy is often um, seen as something annoying or something negative, um, which which is is in a lot of ways wrong. Um, so I think it's just creating this, you know, a, a different um, understanding of, you know, the value of of music has. And I mean, when you look at 15 minute cities, obviously culture and music need to play an important role. Um, otherwise, it, otherwise the whole concept is obsolete in 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 our I mean, in my opinion, because that's that's it's part of the cities that people want to live in. Um, so it's figuring out, you know, how you can make it work, how you can make it work that uh, music spaces and residential and commercial can coexist in a in a sustainable way, without the one being at the risk of being displaced. Are there particular, um, you know, when, when you think of this working really well somewhere, are there particular examples that come to mind? Um, I mean. At the moment, it's anyway very hard to tell <laughs> because I think every, everything is standing still. And um, at least here in Germany, and I think in the UK, it might be different. You know, we haven't really seen this um, batch of closures, which might still come if emergency relief funding phases out um, and things start opening up again. And there are no kind of uh, measurements taken to accompany the, the opening up. Um, but I think, for example, in London, I mean, London has had um, obviously issues with um, venues closing down for a long time. Um, and we also, I mean, it was not me, but our office in London worked with the GLA on figuring out how they can, you know, work against this. So they, they established a couple of things um, to make sure to understand the situation, which so far, at least until the pandemic, were successful. And one of them is the cultural infrastructure mapping. And the other one is the agent of change um, um, law, which was um, put into place, um, which basically is a is a is a law that um, protects um, venues from displacements if there are new developments. So let's say you have a music venue and there's a there's something new being developed um, within vicinity, um, they need to make sure that um, the person or that the entity that, that was there first. Um, doesn't is not being displaced if new people move in. So let's say a new resident moves in, um, they can't, they, you know, they can't complain that there's a music venue which has already existed um, before. Um, so that's a that's a, a good framework of 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 protecting um, these spaces of of being displaced um, of new developments. I think um, Pat, this is also like very much touching um, both your research as well as um, uh, the Birmingham Live Music Project. Yeah. Um, yeah, is there anything you want to add to that? Otherwise, I yeah. have another question. Um, so there are a few things which actually uh, Lucas mentioned and some of the work which we actually do with the um, um, UK branch of sound diplomacy also in Birmingham. So some of the works and implementation of the laws and changes into it. Um, currently, the largest problem is just um, explaining, oddly enough, to policymakers what is the live music venue in the city. Um, so very often, people that we talk with, they have and they had this like dark hole in the ground, um, very often with just one entrance um, and kind of square shaped. And from our work, and mostly in Birmingham, but also going outside. Uh, neither of the venues are just exactly the same. Every one of them differs, and it's always hard to create a one-fit policy. But the thing which we're working on mostly is actually policymakers to actually understand that when they're creating a policy, um, they have to take into consideration a number of things. How do the how the venues differ? How implementation, for example, of the um, roadmap to reopening, how it will actually affect the population of venues in the city, and some of the things which Lucas also mentioned, the agent of change, which is being pushed now um, much more strongly than it before, is one of the fantastic initiatives which basically protects the venues from the future development, which will just step in and people will complain about the noise. They can't do it anymore because venue is there in the place. So the agent of change, the new development, cannot 
anymore be responsible for closing of the venue. Um, next to that, obviously, a big issue coming up also with what Ali mentioned um, very directly to like a lot of things which were pre in process of development before COVID related to physical spaces now are a bit harder to apply because it's hard to see okay how you're going to work on on a space if there is no mobility there are restrictions with the movements and so on and some of the things which we worry about um, the most is actually the closing rates of the places so we know that historically especially london is here like really good example there were historical venues which were being closed because of for example um re renting um, rates or licensing documents and things like that an agent of change was helping with that but now with the pandemic itself, some of the packages uh, which are coming to support them are simply not enough. And we're already observing around 10% close rate. So venues which closed with the idea, oh, we're just gonna go down for like three, four months, are already kind of showing signs they're not coming back later on. So there are venues in Birmingham, um, for example, which are, they started as a, oh, we're just going down for uh, three weeks or four weeks of the first lockdown last year in March. And they're at the stage when they already stated we're not coming back anymore. So this is kind of ongoing process. Does this uh, tend to affect like certain types of venues more than others or like certain types of music more than others? Um, so without going super technical and so um, and so on, majority of the venues which are at the largest risk of closing are the ones which state that music is only part of their business. So those are, for example, um, the ones which had like um, pub or bar, a bit of a restaurant. Um, and because of that went down on top of that, the music wasn't any more enough to sustain the venues. So the one, the venues which had music as a priority, as a main aspect, those are still working with governmental funding, like culture recovery fund, um, some of the um, help from the Arts Council England. So, but those are defined as purely music venues, not that they have a mixed model, which is unfortunately mostly predominant in the UK, so around 50% of venues, depending on the city, actually have a mixed combination. So there will be like a pub or a bar or a restaurant which occasionally puts on music, but they are part of the music ecology. They're also important. Thanks. Um, I just want to say to uh, to everyone watching, um, whether you're what um, whether you're on the Korean Music Tech Brain Trust uh, and on the Slack, or whether you're on YouTube or Twitch or Facebook, you can use the the comments. Um, under or next to the live stream to ask questions of the panelists. Um, we'll see them come in into our like streaming software and we can like put those questions uh, to the experts here. Um, and the same, by the way, to to you, uh, everyone with me on the stream, if you have questions for each other, just like unmute and interrupt me and um, uh, like to, let's turn it into more of a conversation. Um, I wanted to move to, to Astrid because uh, we've now touched a lot of topics that I'm sure affect VOOC in some way. Um, I'm, I'm curious about um, how uh, you've been uh, kind of weathering the pandemic, um, but also considering um, all, the, um, all the aspects of VOOC. I'm really curious about, I, I assume you work in some way with the government or local governments, uh, and I'm curious to hear more about that also. Yeah, um, I, I'd like to um, touch upon things that Pat and Lucas have said before as well, um, because it's really important to know that VUK is a, has a very central location in the city of Vienna. It's a 10 minute walk from the city center and you're, you're at VUK. It used to be a factory and about 40 years ago, people squatted the place and in with the hopes of turning it into a cultural center and the, and the city government was actually okay with it and supported it uh, and that's something that's um, that not every everyone has uh, the same luck i'm aware and uh, and it's been really lucky because since 40 years we've had uh, we've had book and it it's been able to um continue the history the rich cultural and musical history of the city of vienna and it's not it's not every day that that politicians actually see the value in this 
so I think it's very important uh, the, the concept of, of music cities and also agent of change, as, as Pat has said, to make sure that the places that are already there and maybe uh, in locations that are that are central, to make sure that those um, those cannot uh, cannot um, be removed by by some someone new uh, coming to the scene. Um, so, for as for your question, Bas, uh, how we, how have we weathered the pandemic? It's uh, kind of the same story. We've had a lot of support from from the government and from the city government, <clears throat> which is um, which is a blessing. And we've also had big support from our community. So we have been able to. Um, of course, we did some live streams and and all the things that uh, that a lot of venues have done. But it's turned out to be not as uh, especially in the music context not very successful our performance um performances have been streamed live and they've been a huge success but as far as music goes and concerts go people just aren't that interested they want the actual space so for us uh we've we've done some uh, some outdoor shows some seated shows in the summer but other than that we've been we've been closed and we've been uh, relying on on the government and city funding and um looking forward so i i assume um Vogue had like a vibrant community around itself also with like a rather long history of uh, for for a venue or like space um i suppose it's like hard to fully stay in touch with that community and i'm curious um how you're looking kind of forward into um reactivating that community in like a physical space as well as like actually staying in touch with that community and also the, um like astrid this is a question to you but actually also to to ellie uh, kind of looking forward um you know, one right now, how do you stay connected with communities? But two, how you do you like reactivate that? Should I start? Um, so you're absolutely right, and it's been it's been very interesting from from a work perspective to see that because before the the concert was the main product uh, we were able to, we were promoting. And uh, we have uh, we have our own media. We have our website. We have a magazine. We have uh, program flyers and all that kind of stuff. Now that's the only thing we have. So before it used it was a a tool to get people to come to our venue. Now it's the only way to stay in contact. We have social media, but what are we? What content do we do we put out there if there's not a concert to promote? So we have a community and. Uh, kind of the lucky thing we we had was that our main um issue during this time was not actually the pandemic but uh, the the renovations that are going to start soon at VOOC. so we already started some fundraising campaigns before the pandemic and in this way we're able to um to do some more community building and to to uh, gain a deeper trust and deeper bond with our with our audience before the pandemic so that was very useful to us uh, now in this special situation but i think you know let's let's be honest here uh, people come to vuk to see a, a live concert or a live performance they want the experience of the event and that's what we're here for and so as soon as it's possible again we're going to do that Uh, yeah, Ellie, is there? Oh, I think you're muses still. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think for us, it's quite an interesting question because we were trying to build a community after the pandemic began. You know, the the, I, the building work for the Highly started last January, and then lockdown happened, um, so the building work was suspended, and we still wanted to instead of reconnect, we wanted to launch our community. So what we actually did last summer was a host of um, online panels to give people a taste of the kind of thing that we'd be doing when we could eventually open our doors. So we did an event series called Opportunity in the Crisis, which basically offered useful and actionable advice to people in the music industry during what is, we all know, a really tough time for the industry. So we kind of set the tone by saying, you know, the whole idea of Halley is it's about productivity, it's about helping people. So we launched our brand online by saying, here are some free online events for you to kind of 
to help you during this time. So we, that's how we started to build, like Astrid said, a kind of online thing where we then started to re uh, release more content around this subject. And then when it came to activating the community, when we opened our doors last summer, people already had quite a good idea of what we were trying to do and what we were trying to achieve, except this time we brought it to a kind of a physical space. Sadly, we haven't been able to do any in-person panels, as I don't think anyone has, but people kind of know that's who we are and what we're about. And, and what I'd say about reactivating it in this other lockdown, we're actually closed at the moment and we're reopening luckily really soon. Um, we're just focusing on the fact that people um, are raring to get back and people, the reason why people join music focused communities is simply because they want to be with other people, they want to create with other people, they want to learn from other people. And all we have to do it, it to kind of restart is just reignite that kind of passion around that kind of community feeling within our in, within our membership base and also within our kind of local area as well by really kind of creating that buzz which everybody is missing so much, particularly those people in the music and um, creative industries. Um, I see that we got a question from uh, one of the streams. I can feature it here. Uh, it's by Matthias, um, who uh, is the main organizer uh, of the conference. Um, still, I'm going to treat it exactly like I would with uh, any other audience questions. So please feel free to, to add your questions to the chats. Um, I suppose this, uh, this is a question um, primarily for uh, Astrid and um, Ellie about um, have your, I, I think we can all see it. I'll just say it out loud for everyone who cannot see it. Have your spaces been equipped with video and audio tech so that hybrids or online events become possible? And um, I'm also curious about hearing how you see kind of hybrid events. Let's say everything goes back to normal, like let's, you know, September. I think that's too, too optimistic, but let's see. Um, do you see a future for like hybrid events or uh, doing online events as you have been doing? I'll go first. So we, I think one of these things like that we have done in this time is we have been quite reactive. So we opened the space and we immediately realized that we needed Zoom and um, A, the technicality, tech, technical abilities in our spaces. So we have actually hosted a few kind of Zoom online panels where the speakers have been in the space and then they've been broadcasting out. And we also have that, have done that in one of our studios they're, as they're, sound insulated booths, they're actually excellent for broadcast live streams. So I guess by, um, I'm not sure what, what you mean by a, a hybrid event though, like what, what's an example of, of that? Um, I think where, where part of the audience is in the space and part of the audience is distributed. Yeah, I think that that's definitely possible. And I think the great thing about everybody being focused to move online in the last 12 months is even with an example of this conference, the kind of capabilities and the reach can be so much more than, than what we ever really realized before. So you can have speakers from all over the world and you can have people tuning in from all over the world. And it's certainly something I see happening in the future is we have an event space that has been literally designed to be, to have people in, to have panels, but we could very easily be streaming a, a speaker in, you know, from Austria or something. And it just allows us to be a lot more creative with, with what we can offer people and a lot less restrictive in that way. Having said that, I, I don't think that online events will replace in-person events simply because certainly in London and you know, in the kind of startup creative world, people go to these events because they want to network, because they want to meet people. Uh, yes, the panelists and the um, knowledge is important, but you also go because you want to talk to other people doing the same thing as you. And there are replacements for that online, Zoom rooms and stuff, but it, it's just not the same. I completely, I completely agree with you, Ellie. Um, it's uh, people go to concerts to feel, you know, to feel the bass uh, and to feel the audience in front of them and behind them and the beer and everything. Um, but I do think it's a it's a very exciting time because the 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 live stream technology is being used now in more and more creative ways, and I think we're gonna see some very creative solutions for that kind of medium. But what we have seen, what's not working, is just to try to copy the physical event and make it 
uh, make it an online event. That's that's something that nobody's interested in. So you have to work with the medium and you have to find new solutions. And that's something that where creative people are now finding uh, new possibilities, but I don't think we're there yet. We actually have in about 40 minutes, another uh, panel, like this panel will go another 10 minutes, then we'll be another panel. And after that panel, we'll have um, a session about immersive experiences, meaning not just a live stream, but rather uh, uh, experiences where um, people and artists enter a virtual space together, such as virtual reality and things like that. Um, so also invitation to everyone on the panel to stay stay tuned if you're interested in that. Um, yeah, I want to kind of provoke just with, with one phrase, um, Lucas, perhaps, hybrid music cities. Uh, I'm just curious how you see um, how you see this trend of um, yeah, like the hybrids and um, the the digital layer to our everyday experience of everything, but also culture and music um, persisting beyond um, beyond or like sorry, accelerating as a trend and then persisting beyond the pandemic. Um, how do you how do you see that, and how do you think that might affect? Um, music cities as as the concept goes yeah i mean i i think this also ties into obviously what ali and astrid said um and i also want to reiterate um kind of on the hybrid notion i think for example like a conference like this it's amazing that we're able to participate and meet without traveling and i can just be in this room and then in 20 minutes continue working again it's very efficient um, but I, I think that's that's when you talk about physical spaces. I think the important notion that's 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 um, that needs to be discussed is this indirect value, or like the indirect value of meeting. That's hard to grasp, and you know a lot of research has been done around creative hubs and around spaces and the value they have. But it's very hard, and there's no model to actually fully show the the the, the, the this kind of effect, this network effect of people um, randomly meeting offline and 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 starting to talk and starting to develop ideas um, so spaces like book spaces like the Halley, you know they they have an, a tremendous value locally in opening up and giving space for people to meet and to to develop these ideas um, talking about hybrid music cities it's an interesting concept maybe that's something we need to talk about um, I mean I think the, the very positive thing is that this pandemic has accelerated a lot of things maybe also especially in germany um and people have been faced with the reality of 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 you know digitization and and moving um things online and experimenting more and i think after you know after the initial shock of people not knowing what's going on i think we're going to actually see a lot more experimentation a lot more things going on in the next couple of years and you already see that happening also with you know big companies um, investing and moving into uh, online live streaming. I think it's still going to be quite a niche and um, maybe for you know sustainable for bigger artists or very niche or special concepts. Um, and yeah, in terms of in terms of music cities, I'm unsure. I mean, I think it's gonna everything has been accelerated and it makes it even more important to you know to take a step back and and think strategically around how certain issues are affecting the music ecosystem and really um, reframe the debate about how you know policy can um, can actually build a better infrastructure um, for a music to work sustainably Pats, I saw you um, nodding for basically throughout the entire conversation well, yeah, because it's um, all kind of summing up some of the work which we have been doing till now. And it's interesting to see how uh, what Lucas said, how the pandemic actually accelerated a lot of changes, a lot of development. Um, but interesting enough, it also pointed to the fact that a physical space is actually still necessary. 
So those exchanges, which, for example, Ali was talking about, is actually something which it's hard to measure. And it's one of the things which we're actually struggling in, um, similar with, um, when Lucas is doing research or we're doing the research in, um, in the team here, is putting the, the value on the social um, and cultural aspect of the venues and uh, music and um, musicians and sound engineers and so on, meeting in one physical space. Because um, normally when you're working on the topic, everyone asks you like, okay, how much is it going to cost? Um, and when you're trying to say, well, but there's tons of benefits and they're like, oh, how much money is going to bring? It's not all about that. It's that physical space has an importance in the culture and, um, and social culture aspect. And that's something which is really hard to grasp, but it, it can't be undervalued. It's extremely important. Um, and some of the things, when we're talking, for example, about the hybrid cities, so the ones, um, hybrid music cities, so they're developing the new models when there's um, streaming going on at the same time when the live event is happening. Um, so technology is progressing very quickly. There are some options to do it. But some of the things that we um, discovered um, in Birmingham, but also colleagues in Liverpool, for example, the large problem of that is that at the stage as it is now, um, it's not a very sustainable model. Because, for example, if venue puts on live stream, um, they don't have enough technology to actually make it more sustainable, have a solid income from that, um, bring in the artists who will also be paid for the performance, the sound engineer that will be working in the background. So that's something which larger companies can afford, but not the venues which are actually the core um, and the focus of the live music. So in that sense, it it's getting there but it's not yet so it's a beautiful concept i can't wait for actually see the hybrid music cities it's um we, we have like a couple of minutes left before the next panel which is actually about resilience so uh, i think that's uh, it will be like a good a good bridge from that um yeah i think i mean also coming out of the uh pandemic obviously um I, I think at least there will be a phase where local music will, will be very important because it will just be really hard to uh, to travel, um, both in terms of kind of music tourism as well as touring. Uh, and we can already see some scenes around the world that have been lucky enough to have con uh, governments and societies able to contain the virus where music scenes are uh, active, either in like limited capacity or even like fully open. Um, I'm curious to hear, hear uh, basically the panel's thoughts about um, local music scenes uh, over the next year or so um, and, and developments there. Right, let's, um, let's try Birmingham then. That's a tricky one. Um, so there are a few things which are kind of easy to predict. So as we're looking now at the promoters planning and with regard to, for example, lack of insurance for the coming festivals and so on, it looks like this summer will not be yet very exciting. There will be some festivals coming, but it will be tricky. But something which really comes up as a, as a predominant model is actually local touring. So there will be a lot of gigs which are put by the bands which are actually from the region. So they haven't traveled a lot. Um, they've done, so for those who don't know geography, Birmingham is a part in the middle, literally of the UK. Um, and we have quite a lot of um, links to, for example, Manchester, Coventry, Liverpool. It's not big distance um, from the city. So the bands which we're going to see, it's going to be actually Birmingham and the new vicinity. So that's the music scene, live music scene in coming, um, coming months, probably all the way till the end of the year. And I think only from 2022, we're going to actually see more international tours and even those which will be going farther away from Birmingham. So maybe we'll see some bands coming from Scotland, but that's, in the optimistic version, I think we're talking on the end of summer and then international touring towards the second half um, of autumn. Let's let's end then on, on that optimistic note. Um, 45 minutes flies by. Thank you so much, Fat, Astrid, Lucas and Ellie for uh, joining us. Um, I want to call Matthias uh, back to the stage to 
start the next panel. Hi, yeah, and thank you guys for um, really interesting um, conversation. I was um, firing out a question there to uh, get people going. Um, so um, now um, we're on with um, a panel on resilience is in the network. And um, I'm really excited. This is going to be a short panel. I'm really excited to have uh, three phenomenal guests with me. Um, and I call them on stage, Flavia Furtado. Please come on stage. She is the executive director of Amazonas Opera Festival in Brazil. And she will tell us about the Brazilian Forum of Opera, Dance and Concert Music. Welcome. Thank you very much, Matthias. It's a pleasure to be here with you and with all of people who are watching us. Great. So, yeah, uh, we're happy to have you, um, someone in South America right now. We have also Matthias uh, Strobel. Matthias Strobel is the co-founder and president of Music Tech Germany. Welcome, Matthias. It's really great to have you here. Thanks for having me. It's awesome. Yeah. Great. Uli Köstinger is the chief content officer at Opera Base, where she oversees partnerships and the expansion of the network. Hi, Uli. Can you hear us? Uli, are you there? I think Uli cannot hear us, or can she? No sound with yeah, Uli? Actually, the connection is quite... Um, I don't hear a lot. It, it breaks up. Okay, well... You can try to get your connection reset maybe while um, I'll begin then maybe with Flavia. Flavia, um, we had a really interesting conversation um, uh, yesterday or was it a couple of days ago where you told me the story of um, the um, uh, Amazonas Opera Festival um, um, and that it, that it had a really interesting uh, story of how it got started. Do you want to quickly tell us how the Opera Festival got started in Manaus? Yes, sure. Well, actually, it got it started because of a German violinist who was a fan of its Cajaldo movie from Herzog. And he had his, his dream to do an opera in that theater from the movie. So uh, he came out to Brazil right after the 100 year festivity of the theater and it was like very bad uh, festivities because the city was uh, the, uh, if you know the history of the city the city was very rich in the late uh, 18, uh, 19th century and uh, because of the rubber uh, uh, period and then the rubber period died when the rubber was stolen for other countries and so the city died so the, the theater was restored, but it works as a museum. There was mm -hmm. nothing there. Mm -hmm. And so the 100 years festivities were very not, uh, uh, quite not a festivity. So the governor was very unhappy. The secretary of culture were very unhappy. And then comes this violinist, uh, a German violinist with a sponsorship from Volkswagen, also a German <laughs> company. <laughs> and saying that he wanted to do an opera there and they said oh okay let's try this so they did they brought everything from minsk mm -hmm. <laughs> from eastern uh, eastern european country and uh so they did the first opera festival like bringing every everything actually they did the first two opera festivals with everything from minsk orchestra sets costumes and solos everything and with the choir that was in the church and then the governor and the secretary, secretary of culture said, okay, that's it. We want that for, for our city. So that's how this, the, the orchestra started. The orchestra was founded in, 2000, in 1997. Mm -hmm. And since then we have choir, dance groups and everything and, and the opera festival since then, 22 well, editions. <laughs> what I found very interesting was that um, you told me about the uh, structure of the opera world in, in Brazil and that um, uh, there is a lot of change in the uh, um, directors of the opera houses uh, normally, but in Manaus, it's a different story. It's someone who has been doing the job for over 12 years, I believe, um, uh, uh, and, um, and, and that is... Uh, uh, 
a very interesting uh, difference to all of the other places in Brazil. And I mentioned that because you are also the founder of the Brazilian Forum of Opera, Dance and Con Concert Music, which is the network of all of these cultural institutions in in Brazil that you founded. Um, it is a relatively recent development. You founded it last year during the uh, pandemic. Is that correct? Yes. Well, uh, our sector was very known in Brazil as not participating of any cultural discuss uh, politics mm -hmm. or because we were we always had this struggle. Every time all the orchestras, most of the orchestras and almost all the, the big theaters belong to governments. So every time you change the politics, you change the, 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 the director and then normally it's a political uh, uh, place. So the people has nothing to do with culture or with that, uh, with uh, classical music. And then it's very difficult to get people together. So uh, for years, people were, because the the first the directors they change but we don't change we the artists and the management we are always working here and there and we know it, each other but also it was very difficult to get everyone to sit down and to mm -hmm. talk and to agree with anything <laughs> mm -hmm. but we started as a group of uh, of um, whatsapp 20 mm -hmm directors of theaters and orchestras with the pandemic and saying, oh, are you going to close? You were, oh, I'm going to close tomorrow. You were, I'm still not. And then, and then we said, maybe this is a good time to start finally to get people together and to try again to do this, but learning with the other mistakes that we did before, because this was not the first attempt. Anyway, so this was a very um, uh, ad hoc getting together on, on WhatsApp. Uh, Flavia, I want to jump to Matthias because yes, I so. think the way he started his network um, is um, it's also something that is in dialogue with politicians, Matthias, um, uh, but you started it more in a, in a um, um, uh, I, I should say, uh, structural fashion. Can you tell us a little bit about when you started the network, what was your goal, how did it uh, come about, and what happened last year during the pandemic to the network? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so when I started Music Tech Germany, that was in 2017 in July, so we are a pretty young association. Um, the first thing that I had in mind when, I, so we started in a really informal way, I tried to gather all the people that I know from the music tech scene here in Berlin and see if we can start a Berlin network for music tech people. Um, just to like say something up front about music tech Germany because a lot of people might not know what it is about. So we are in uh, the Federal Association for Music Technology. That means that we represent um, the ones who are building the tools for artists to be creative and um, have an economic income. That's everything from people who build notation software to instrument builders, music software developers to streaming services and so on and so on. And um, so there was no association like that. We didn't have any kind of like um, role model that we could follow afterwards and um, see it's how It's the first in the world, right? It's be, it was the first in the world and we are super happy that others um, have been following it and um, have started their own associations. So there's something like Music Tech France now and we have a Music Tech Association in Chile actually. Oh. So um, there's like lots of other music tech networks in general in Europe and around the world, but then um, these are the two that I'm aware of that actually have started something on a more um, on a more meta level, on a higher level that um, try to involve everyone. And that's also what we wanted to do. We wanted to include everyone, not just the people who are based in Berlin. And music tech has a long history in Germany from from you know from in the Berliner to MP3 to all that that's been like um, innovated here in in this country. So we decided to try if we can start a federal association for many reasons. One reason was that the funding structure and the funding system here in Germany was not really um, prepared or it was not really made for music tech um, startups and entrepreneurs. So we wanted to change that. Usually you have like high tech um, funding here in Germany or you have cultural funding. Mm -hmm. And whenever you apply for something, it's either you get dismissed because you're too techy for <laughs> cultural funding or you're too arty for tech funding. So we need it to, or it's still in the making, we need to change this because the digital transformation happened in the music industry big time, as everybody knows. And um, the ones who are actually are the thriving force behind this um, entire change and um, uh, development in the music industry are these music tech startups. And um, we can 
have great products and services if there is a, is a proper funding structure and we not only rely on VCs and other kinds of funding. And a lot of startups are dying because they can't afford it. So this was one reason we wanted to mm -hmm. change the funding structure. Then, of course, we wanted to build like kind of a, a, an organized network that people can meet each other, can exchange each other um, thoughts with each other because like lots of startups are building kind of the same thing because they don't know from each other and um, we wanted to change this in order to make them uh, give them an opportunity to talk to each other and um, collaborate with each other so mm -hmm. that's why we started with the with the slogan in the mind um, innovation through collaboration we want to like bridge between like music tech people themselves but also between music tech people and the music industry music tech uh, startups and entrepreneurs here in Germany, but also outside of Germany, Europe, and the entire world. So I'm pretty happy right now that um, we are now kind of like managed to establish something that um, has value, that um, kind of like shows the entire diversity of the music tech space, not all of it, but a lot of it. And um, we, have a, we have built up a proper network to other music tech networks and associations around Europe and in Asia and in the US. So the future goal is to um, connect these dots even more in order to join forces and um, create a more collaborative and a more innovative music ecosystem that can build new tools and products out of itself and don't have to rely on big music, uh, big tech giants like um, like yeah. we have seen with YouTube and all that stuff. Yeah. So so we have Flavia's network, which is um, a, um, a very um, uh, uh, community-driven grassroots um, uh, network. We have uh, you, Matthias, uh, with a network that was a little bit more formal, with a, a political vision also, and and an economic vision. And then we have Uli. Uli is working for Opera Base. And um, uh, for those of you who who are Opera fans, you will know what Opera Base is. But Uli, could you perhaps let us know? Um, uh, what is the network that you are building? It is a database of performances, but really behind it is an amazing network of people in the opera space. But I think we've lost, are, are you there? Yes. You just have to unmute yourself. Yes, I'm, yes. I'm here. Um, hello again. Um, my connection Great. was unfortunately not working, but now it is. And Opera Base is actually, we exist since 25 years. It started as a, an opera lover in 1996 and he suddenly collected all the data um, who is performing where and suddenly after some years uh, it was the first casting tool the first online casting tool used by opera houses and especially casting directors so we have this professional tools where you if you're looking for don giovanni you can go back the last like 25 years who has sung this role and where and then you can just, as a casting director, call the agent and look at the profiles of the artists. And last year, or yeah, in the last two years, we discovered that actually 1.5 million audience members are using that tool for information to see who right. is performing when, what's the artist like. And so now we established it also, we're coming, it will always be a professional tool for the opera houses and the artists and the agency to be connected to each other with honest, very honest data. Um, but for the music lovers, it's really also, they can see where can I buy a ticket? Where can I watch this video? Where can, can I watch a performance? And we are operating worldwide. Mm -hmm. And this is a, um, is this a group of people who do this or is this a company, a pro for-profit company? How are you organized? Well, we are a, subscri a subscription-based company. So our holding company is called Arts Consolidated. Um, it's a Danish company, Danish Austrian company. And we have employees in, I think, 12 countries. So we have 30 people. Half of it are opera, um, opera singers themselves or have a music background to be in touch with the opera companies. And the other half are really tech engineers and developers to work on the database and to work on all the features which will soon be upcoming. And we are um, a subscription-based model. So basically, an opera house pays a subscription fee to have access to that casting tool or an agency pays a subscription fee to have all their artists presence in the professional way or an artist themselves um, pays a subscription fee. 
But to be, um, it's not only a paid platform. Of course, you're also as a singer on opera base if you're simply somewhere performing in the world. Um, mm -hmm. You're probably not there with a video or you can't, can't add your repertoire and your repertoire to debut, but you are listed with all your performances if you're singing in Paris or Milan or, or somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, the amazing thing about opera is that it is really a global thing. Like, um, you know, uh, it's it's pretty much the same repertoire everywhere. And uh, so there are people I know. I know people who traveled the world to go see particular opera performances. But the pandemic, when it hit, of course, it shut down a lot of the um, or almost all of the opera houses. How has that affected uh, your your business, Uli? And then I want to also talk uh, again to Flavia about how she was dealing with the pandemic in her network. Um, how has has that impacted you guys? Uli, maybe first. Yes, um, what we realized is, I was talking before about the audience members looking for tickets and where they can watch something in the world. It changed that we really saw they are looking for videos during the corona pandemic. So. Or mm -hmm. So we're still in the pandemic, but like in the last year, it was the search for video was suddenly coming, becoming more powerful. And that's also where we did our homework to establish now also a platform which is con connected to Opera Base, where the audience can find the videos, but also the casting directors can find videos if they're looking for a specific performance um, that will be soon launched. Actually, that was one of our homeworks in the in the last year. and. What is with opera? It's also, I mean, there were houses were open again uh, in September, October in some countries during the summer. So the searches in the casting tool raised up. And also in opera, you plan very much in advance ahead. So um, we still, all the houses use the tool because they're planning their, their next season and the season afterwards. And, and like you can say, almost three years in advance. Mm -hmm. um, where and also we wanted to support the industry is that we are really now supporting the young artists. So we are in collaboration with a lot of opera studios, with a lot of universities and with competitions to really support them from the very beginning, offer them a yearly free subscription if they're part of a certain university or uh, an opera studio from an opera house, which is a partner of us. So we said we need to support especially young artists. Mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. Thank you, Flavia. How about um, uh, your network? How did that evolve? Yes, very badly, as you can imagine. Mm. Well, all the theaters are, are closed now for the second time uh, because we are hitting a second wave of, of the pandemic, much harder than the first one here in Brazil. Uh, what? Well, we had only, from what I can remember, three semi-staged uh, very small operas, very uh, uh, few people on stage and few orchestra members last year in counting whole Brazil, you know, but most of the theaters, they were closed and they, when they reopened last year, they reopened with chamber music. We did, we reopened with chamber music. What we did in the Amazonas Opera Festival is to change completely the, the artistic uh, program, program we invited three young composers to compose new works, new operas for from half an hour each. And we are going to, one is going to be a cartoon, another, the other two is going to be recorded in, a, in one in a museum, another one in a, in a set. So not on stage, we are not doing on stage and recording on video, we are doing like a, a film. And also, we because we wanted to support our artistic uh, people in Brazil, we invited another, I think, 12 or 20 composers, Brazilian composers, to compose or to to send us some material that they have for chamber groups mm -hmm. and, and singers. And we are do, going to do that. But mm -hmm. since we have the second wave and we are now have to close again, we stopped in the middle of the production of this uh, new uh, festival with the pandemic uh, 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 artistic uh, uh, worries, and we are we don't know when we can open again and continue mm -hmm. the production. But it hit hard 
mm -hmm. and all the theaters of Brazil. How, how would how many theaters do you think um, have been equipped with um, uh, digital uh, technologies so that um, you could broadcast performances? Do you have a number on this? I would say like one, two. None of them had of, uh, uh, this equipment inside the theater before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's with, sometimes we in Manaus, we did with the help of the TV, local TV, public TV. So we record the, the, the operas and, and broadcast locally. But since now, we, I think we have two, only two theaters who have bought uh, uh, cameras and, and hired people to, to do that professionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but and um, Tom, uh, um, uh, Matthias, is this is this something that you see right now in the group of startups that you're working with that there is more emphasis on technology to equip spaces, um, uh, or is this something that is not a topic? Oh, there's lots of startups um, popping up that are um, offering their services. Like most of the locations, it doesn't matter if it's clubs or opera houses or theaters. Um, most of them have like not installed them themselves. They are rather hire companies that come in with their equipment, produce a couple of shows and go out again with their equipment mm -hmm. because they just can't afford it, even though there was some uh, funding here in Germany that um, clubs and um, other locations could um, get funding to invest in these kind of systems. Um, not a lot of them did, but um, uh, I would say if you are based here, um, you could definitely um, hire someone that could give you the entire production equipment and um, manpower to execute any kind of concert that you wish for. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the more and more this technology gets accessible and um, as we see, I mean, we have four people all with a webcam all in our homes and we, uh, we managed to, to run a panel on a conference. Um, of course, the artistic um, approach or basically the, the, uh, the, the, what, are, what art is trying to achieve can't be really replicated in a, in a, in a digital forum. Um, usually you could change the narrative and you could change certain elements to make it fit for a digital production. But um, usually, like I'm, I'm, I'm totally in the tech space and digital space, but I also believe that the feeling that you get from a live experience, doesn't matter if it's music, dance, theater, whatever, um, you can't, you will never be able to replicate it in the digital world because like the, the atmosphere in the room, the energy in the room, the bass that you can feel, even in a club, the sweaty people around you, when you're on a concert, the people screaming next to you, all that kind of things. This is what makes life experiences unique and um, you can't really replicate it, but you can come up with new, new experiments with, with new kind of like narratives, as I said, or with new kind of production systems. And we see that, I mean, with the, with we are and with all the metaverse now um, getting more and more attention. There's uh, startups focusing on that space. There's, um, I mean, I'm I'm a big believer in that there will be a hybrid future future for everything, but mm -hmm. um, um, it's gonna be different in the future. And there's also an advantage to all that stuff. Um, we, for example, we did a collaboration with a, with a company with an association called Handicap. They um, take care of disabled people and organize live concerts here in Berlin for this bands with disabled people. And we run a hackathon with them, and we wanted to do it as an in-person hackathon. And the goal of the hackathon was to um, develop tools that um, make it easier for disabled people to um, have a proper life experience, access to life experiences, mm -hmm. but also finding companions and all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And um, we wanted to do this in person. And what we thought is like a disadvantage because we now have to make it digitally and the entire experience get lost. It was actually an advantage because um, people could work from the comfort of their home. They could use the tools that are used anyway to use. So yeah. it, it depends what you do. And if you're doing an artistic production, I think um, it's really hard to replicate that or to find a new way of doing it. If you do something like a conference, a workshop, mentoring, all these kind of things that don't require you to sit next to a person, um, that's definitely um, an advantage to have um, these online and digital formats now these days. You know, I always think like, um, why don't we create new art forms? Um, that, you know, are uh, digital or hybrid native rather than always trying to take what, what has worked for hundreds of years in the theater and try to replicate that one one to one in the digital space. Like I always say my personal, uh, my, my real world character, Matthias, 
want something else from my online avatar. It's, you know, I'm not the same person. It's like a split personality kind of thing, I guess. Uh, but um, uh, you have you have different needs. You have different, um, you know, attention spans also. So, yeah, but you also have different opportunities. Like if you do exactly. it in VR, you have an infinite world. So you can dive way much deeper than you could ever do on a stage. You can do mm -hmm. things that you can't do in the real world. You can fly, you can all these kinds of things. So um, I'm pretty sure that there's a lot of smart and creative minds out there that um, have been digging deeper into this. And um, we will see new forms of art in the, in the future in all sorts of areas, not only in music in classical music or electronic music or whatever it is, but also in other art spaces. And this is also one thing that the digital, the digital opportunities brought us is that we will see more um, barriers blurring, more lines blurring between the different um, kind of, now we call it the different areas of the culture and creative industries, is games, films, music, literature, theater, and all that kind of stuff. And we will see more mixed kind of productions, more shows, which will also attract fans from different genres to discover new genres, to become a fan of something that they haven't heard of or that haven't had any connection to. So right. I think the digital space is a good way for people to to experiment with stuff because also the, the cost for, for production or like the, the you don't have to fill up a theater. You can just like click a mm -hmm. camera, open a screen, and then see who comes or doesn't come. And you don't have to pay the rent. You don't have to pay all the other costs that are. Well, unless um, you already to have to pay the rent because. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> true. Flavia, Flavia, do you think that something like, like this is realistic? Um, or do you say, well, yeah, that's very nice, but uh, how, how am I supposed to be doing that with my opera festival? Um, what are your thoughts? I think it's very much realistic. I think mm -hmm. it's the future. The future of opera is developing, like mm -hmm. has always been. And this doesn't mean that my festival is going to stop because I don't think people are stopping reading Shakespeare, for example. Mm -hmm. We are always right. going to, to, to be returning to, to the classics, I mean, to the big artists, mm -hmm. whatever if, if uh, are, they are in, in any art form. But mm -hmm. this is not stopping us to to go forward with mm -hmm. the with the manifestation art manifestation. So I think the future with art and technology it's going to be everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, but nevertheless, it's not going in uh, to diminish what everything that has has been going on for centuries. I think there will be place for everything. I think that's beautiful of you to say because you know the cake. Uh, uh, can be divided many ways, but it can also be uh, grown. So we can have a bigger cake all together. Um, Uli, um, I, I'm really fascinated by the fact that Opera Base really started as a database, but that it has created so much value out of being a database. And, and I just, um, I, I, I would really like people to reflect on that. Like you start with just putting stuff in a database and it can grow into all different sorts of uh, businesses. Is this something that, um, you know, when, when and someone works on a specific project, like a database of opera performances, is this something intentional or is this something that comes to you and all of a sudden you say like, oh, hey, we could also be doing this. We could also do that. Um, what's the development of, of a platform like this? Well, of course, it started as a database because it was in 1996. There was also something <laughs> new to do. Database. Almost, uh, almost no internet even. <laughs> no internet, yeah. Just typing in all the information, and then suddenly, in a niche, as we are speaking of opera, is a, is still it's a niche. Um, mm -hmm. You are also like a first mover, almost. Yeah, there is nothing else which is exists there because it's not mm -hmm. soccer or or tennis or something. And mm -hmm. well, and then of course we have a a team, a developer and team and they really they sat down and they analyzed the data and they analyzed the searches and everything what is there on the platform and then mm -hmm. suddenly came to the conclusion well there are there are just 1.5 million audience members and they are interested in that that and that so it was really like we it wasn't a plan to build now a consumer platform it was always a professional one and we will mm -hmm. always work and develop that professional platform, even thinking about moving to other genres as well from the performing arts, because there is still a need for that. Mm -hmm. Speaking of concerts and, and ballet and, and theater plays, 
Um, but the consumer side is, is even more, more interesting now for us as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is what our, also what our team does every day, analyzing. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, it, I'm really excited that you're going that direction and I, I wish you all the best for that. I think it's going to be um, not the first and the last time that we uh, talk to each other on a forum like this, because uh, this is an interesting um, future ahead. Now, um, we are at the end of our panel and I want to thank uh, the three of you for taking the time for being um, uh, you know, the entertaining guests that you that you were. Um, it was a lot of fun for me to have you three with completely different stories in one panel, but it's all connected via the topic of resilience and network. And I think next year when we meet, um, we'll, we'll probably do it also online um, because um, we found for our network that this works best, um, but I'm also looking forward to meeting you in person uh, again soon. It's going to be easier with Matthias and Uli and a little bit more difficult with Flavia, but we already made plans that once everything is to a new normal where one can travel, I'll come to Brazil. So thank you guys very much. It was a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Matthias. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, Matthias. And now it's uh, time uh, for me to hand over the baton to uh, my colleague, Thomas Richter, um, who will be introducing Hello. the leading. Hi, Thomas, the next uh, panel. Um, Thomas, where are you right now? Yeah. Um, I'm in a hotel room in Dresden, um, and hopefully the connectivity issues are not that big because I experienced some of them. Um, it's all about immersion right now. Not only so, did the pandemic cause musicians to turn to live streams, they've also turned to a whole new breed of virtual events. By creating virtual worlds with software usually applied for video game creation, they can immerse in environments together with their audience and create truly magical experiences. I'm looking forward to talk to Shirley Spikes, CEO and founder of Virtual Studios, and Christian Sander, CEO and co-founder of Dear Reality. Hi. And I say goodbye. Hi. I just wanted to uh, have a chance to get a group photo with you guys. So uh, I have that. And I'll of say course. goodbye. Enjoy. Bye, Matthias. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. How are you two? Good. Great. Good to be Thank here. <laughs> Hope you can hear me well. Hopefully, uh, I can hear you well as, as well, because I'm really having some problems here. But nonetheless, it will be a great session, I think. Um, we are all talking about immersion these days, um, immersion here and there. Um, but we've also been talking about this for 10 years. Has immersion now arrived to, to, the, to the mass audiences? Shirley, you want to go? Uh, I start with it. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> Five of you. Well, I started in virtual reality about, I want to say, four years ago when it was still, no one understood what it is. Everyone knew that it's coming and kind of video games and sci-fi films told us that this reality is going to come and going to be a part of our life. But it was really the beginning part of it. I do see that immersion is becoming more accessible to people thanks to Oculus and HTC Vive that are making it more available for more people. And I think that, honestly, this pandemic is exactly what this world needed to push the VR towards the mainstream and to say, okay, up until now, I didn't know if I should buy a VR headset. Now it is the time. I'm seeing a lot of conferences, a lot of concerts happening in VR, and I do think that it's here to stay. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think uh, it totally changes within the last 10 years, uh, especially what Shirley just said, with the rise of Oculus in 2013, 2014, with her Kickstarter campaign. Before that, I think VR uh, was really like, uh, as you know, in, in universities, very expensive equipment. Uh, so so I, I once was in one of these caves, very expensive. And uh, when I heard about the, the Oculus Kickstarter campaign and they already announced what we finally have now with the uh, Oculus Quest 1 and 2, really a handy consumer headset, I think now we are really there that, that immersive uh, becomes accessible for anyone. And I think that 
happens on the VR side, but also on the, I think, in parallel a little bit on the immersive audio side, what we will talk about, I think, today. Mm -hmm. Since we're in the introductory phase of this panel, uh, Shirley, could you please quickly uh, describe what you are doing? And afterwards, we should have a look at the video you brought. Uh, of course. So Shirley, what is Virtual Studios about? So uh, Virtual Studio is a company that I started um, 2019, so that's two years ago. Um, and that was after uh, winning MIT Reality Virtually Hackathon as top 10 ideas for MIT for that year. And that was my first kind of introduction to VR. Um, so we built a virtual reality symphony orchestra that players can interact with using hand gestures or controllers, we support both of them, uh, to allow full immersion. So users can choose how they want to feel that immersion. And it started as just a simulation to get people to experience what I felt when I was conducting symphony orchestras. And it turned into a video game that turned into an educational software for schools and universities to share kind of the immersive experience mm -hmm. of not only hearing symphonic music, but actually feeling like you're part of it. Because as you're conducting, the music does change based on what you do with your hands. Uh, do you want to just share the video? Yeah, uh, Nikolai, please play the video. It's a video about the Visuality Symphony Orchestra. Put on your headphones and take the net. Okay, this is the video. Yeah. I'm guessing that was Christian's <laughs> video. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, the other one, sorry. Uh, no, that's the Dream Machine. No, 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 the VRSO. But the Dream Machine is the thing we can talk as well. It's um, a project done um, by Berkeley. And take the next step in the video. 3D audio. <laughs> Please, the VIs of Visual Reality Symphony Orchestra video. Also That's now? Another video from us. <laughs> but, but we have plenty of videos. It's quite entertaining. <laughs> Maybe we can reshare the link. I should put link. numbers to it. Sorry. <laughs> oh, wait a sec, please. In the meantime, we can entertain the audience by singing something. <laughs> But it should not be taken down by the algorithm. <laughs> um, quickly drop the link to the technician. Uh, you want me to send the link? Meanwhile, we can let Christian. I, I, I've sent the link to him. All I right. can also post it here as well. It's funny, I was just listening to the other panel, and they just talked about how the future of you know music is going to be with electronics and uh, or with um, full immersion but the idea that when you are in the virtual space you can be a different person than you are or you can have different abilities than you have in reality uh, which I think that our project started as but then it turned out to, and then we realized that you can do more than the time I went on stage oh, to conduct there it is. a full symphony orchestra there it is. was a moment I will remember for the rest of my life I felt like dancing. I felt like I was creating a new kind of magic. VRSO is a virtual reality symphony orchestra. It's an immersive experience that allows the players to feel the magic that I felt when I was on stage in front of a full orchestra. You don't need any experience or prior knowledge, you just need to enjoy music. Using simple cues, the game will guide the player through fantastic symphonic pieces and let the player feel the music in their own hands. As the player progresses through the game, visual indicators appear based on the player's timing. Ice represents cueing too early. Fire, if the player is too late. Sparks, for giving the right cue. And stingers appear when player cues the wrong instrument. If the player cues an instrument at a wrong time, the music will get out of sync. Players can also adjust the volume of the orchestra to match the intensity of the piece. VRSO is not only fun to play, but simultaneously fun to watch, as the player can choose where they want to sit in our grand symphony. 
They can always choose to see the game from the eyes of the player, but different seeds have different perspectives and sound differently in terms of resonance and reverb. At the end of the piece, the player will be able to watch a recording of the piece they performed and of course share it with their friends and family. Amazing. Pretty nice. Thank you. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Definitely. Did you start from scratch from scratch when you were creating it? You you told you were there for two yeah. years in the company. So, so founding uh, it basically. Yeah. Uh, so it started in 2017. Um, I actually am originally from Israel, but I arrived uh, in Boston to go to Berkeley College of Music. And I didn't know anyone. I knew that I wanted to do music tech, uh, but I didn't know anyone around the Boston area. And I just wanted to meet people. So I did the only thing I could, which is go to a bunch of hackathons. Uh, one of them turned out to be, I didn't know it back then, but it turned out to be the biggest air and VR hackathon in the world that is called Reality Virtually in MIT. Um, mm -hmm. And I just came there to just offer myself as a musician, just to write music, maybe for some apps. And then I ended up pitching my own idea, which was a virtual reality symphony orchestra that the player can like interact with in real time. Because immediately, this is something that happened to me every time I tell people about VR. And then they're like, oh my god, I can use it for this. Uh, so this like spark moment that you have when you just hear about new technology, that's the feeling that I went with. Um, so we built a prototype during the hackathon and we turned out to win this hackathon. And then later on, I just took it by myself that my team didn't want to continue with this. So I founded a company around that. And today we're working with uh, different schools and universities to provide to them that experience. And it's probably going to be out next year, but I don't want to promise too much. Um, but we are working on a full version. And during the pandemic, we also found out that people are having problems performing in, in theaters, just in big crowded areas. And when they did a survey about how many people will feel comfortable mm -hmm. about going back to watching a full symphony orchestra, some of them said never, which is quite alarming. But for us, it was an opportunity to come and say, hey, there is a different solution to it that is a little bit more immersive, that is a little bit more engaging to the user because you get to do things and not just sit there and listen in. What do you two think? Um, now we're having emerging technologies. We're having a VR tech nearly available to everyone. But is it available to everyone or are we having more not the best phones in our hands and we need better microphones, we need better uh, headphones, we need better better uh, VR goggles. So is the general public already equipped with the tech to consume actually high-end productions? Mm, I, I wouldn't say not yet, but uh, as Shirley already said, uh, since, the, um, since the pandemic, I think many VR headset got sold out for a few weeks and months. So I think the demand in parallel with, uh, with the release of the Oculus Quest 1 and 2 is, I think, pretty, pretty high and raising pretty much. And from the numbers that we see or somehow you hear from from facebook and oculus uh about vr headsets mm -hmm. being sold i think it's it's growing pretty much and that's that's definitely good for uh, content creators and uh especially uh that project which is pretty pretty nice and a pretty pretty nice idea and i think when when we uh, were back um, a few years ago, also creating uh, VR experiences beside doing technology, maybe I will get to that later. It, it, there was that moment of a VR desert, maybe you've heard about that after all this uh, fun in 2014, 2015, a lot of startups came up. And then in 2016, 2017, there was this VR desert where the consumer VR uh, headsets were not really that ready and not that really widespread around for users to reach that um, 
yeah many users for for your games or your experiences but i think currently we're really at the moment where a lot of vr games especially are are doing pretty big sale numbers and a lot of new ideas come up and this is uh, i think a very good time to start or restart again into this yeah there's a question from philip grafer um, is there any vr platform you can recommend for music music creation professionally not gamified and a space where you can watch concerts or performances or to give this into the panel what do you think is there a solution for that we're working on it <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. Um, there are some applications, most of them I'm seeing through the side quest, which if you haven't got into it, it's incredible. This is a place for uh, developers to just show their work without, um, without the Facebook approval. And I've seen so many apps getting approved to the Oculus official store because they've been on side quest. Uh, and this is a place to just explore different new apps that are coming out to the quest. Uh, so that will be my first place to look for it. Uh, there are mm -hmm. some tools. There's, I think they're called the Wave of VR uh, mm -hmm. that are creating, yeah, um, yeah, that are creating concerts in VR. And I know that they're having a lot of celebrities and like huge concerts that are broadcasting to the world. Um, and as I said, we are working on it. <laughs> I think with everything yeah. that Christian said, the thing I would add is the tech is there, the hardware is there, the users are there. Uh, we're missing apps we don't have enough. Uh, so if you think about your phone with all of the applications that you have on it, imagine that phone five or seven years ago when you had GPS, iTunes, and that's it. Mm. Yeah. That's where we are. Uh, when it, maybe I can Sometimes also when I'm interrupting you, it's just a connection. <laughs> OK. Um, no, I, I just wanted to add the Wave VR, or now they named XR, or the, the changes, of course. They, uh, I think they they are also number one on my my list of uh, regarding the question. I think question number two was where can you experience uh, the concerts. Uh, I think that's definitely a place, especially for electronic and then pop music. I think they just featured the weekend uh pretty pretty big musician and um but but they are really uh i think a very in interesting platform because they started quite early in 2015 2016 at south by southwest where I, where i met them in 2016 they were also quite small and then they got this big funding from the vr funds and they 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 constantly have grown even above this vr valley and i think they yeah had pretty interesting guests there so i think that's that's definitely number one. I think also uh, other platforms have just been announced, which is like the Sony Immersive Music Studios. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they, they have like demos where you can yeah see how musicians are being tracked, their their, visual, their uh, face and everything there. But uh, I'm not sure if it's already released. I think it was like a CES news thing, but that's definitely something to look after. And I think the the most successful virtual concert that we had, I think one year ago was from Fortnite with like 12, 12 million visitors that all could the join. Biggest concert and, in the world. Yeah. In history. Um, yeah. And that's pretty nice because they just use the platform that hundreds of millions of gamers worldwide use um, through the Epic's game engine. And this is definitely uh, things to look at if you if you're interested in uh, experiencing concert, concerts. If you uh, searching for tools to create uh, virtual music or produce professional um, immersive audio productions, um, I think definitely the video from what we're doing might be interesting later to look at. Um, so there, there is definitely a lot going on in the music and audio technology world where, where I come from uh, in terms of workflows. It's it, it was a kind of a little bit wild west over the last years, but now standards coming up, depending where you are, if you're talking about music production with Dolby Atmos, Sony 360 stuff, or if you're talking about gaming, wh where there are a lot of engines um, that you can implement into your VR productions to have immersive audio. There is, by the way, before we come uh, to Dear Reality itself, um, a video we were showing before, which was a little uh, um, mistake we did, but now we could bring it up on stage. It's the Dream Machine from Berkeley. 
It was produced by Berkeley's Electronic Production Design Department. Let's have a quick look into this. But in total, it's a five minutes video. We can't look at the whole thing, watch the whole thing in a moment. But it gives you an idea of how the um, computer gaming industry and the music industry can work together. Um, unfortunately, the speaker today can't be here, but we're very glad she sent this video. Perfect. Um, Shirley, um, have you been connected to this project or heard about this um, due to yes, your uh, East Coast connection? <laughs> uh, I have. Actually, I'm really sad that uh, Lori Lande could not be here. She was my teacher and mentor at Berkeley College of Music and the one who kind of guided me into the world of VR. Um, the Dream Machine, I was supposed to be a part of this project. So this is the electronic, uh, we call it EPD, Electronic Production and Design Department, plus the Film Scoring Department at Berkeley combining forces together with, I believe, Nona Hendrix uh, to create this kind of like immersive experience for experiencing music uh, and feeling music. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to work on that project because I was working on my own projects. Um, but yeah, it was a production that I think is still going on at Berkeley. Christian, what do you think about that? Um, how is it integrated, um, the video world, uh, the video gaming world, and the music world? Uh, you, you mean in this demo video or uh, generally? Hmm? In, general. In, in general. In general and in the video. So coming yeah, from I, the video and then... Uh, yeah. yeah, I think... Uh, I mean, if we talk about video gaming world, we, we talk about interactive and being uh, and immersion. And uh, I think that's what what we need, uh, especially for like digital concerts uh, where we yeah can't really be at a real concert. So there, there are or were already a lot of approaches uh, that started with like 360 video. I guess everyone had like a cardboard on his face uh, in the <laughs> within the last years where you were able to see like a Paul McCartney concert quite near but but of course the next step is not just having like a 360 video but really uh, where you have like only three degrees of freedom you can only only rotate uh, but definitely the next step is then six degrees of freedom where you can not only rotate but also walk around and for this there are two choices or two ways to do that the one would be like um, uh, point clouds like doing doing three uh, videos where you really have um, all 3D information of the whole scene, and then you can walk through all that scene. Um, that's the one way. Or the other way is to have the whole stage and everything virtual, uh, as we, uh, as already said, with Sony Immersive Music Studios or uh, the ways we are, where you really can walk around. And I, 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 I played the ways a few times, and they changed pretty often. But what I really liked was that you could like. Uh, the times when they were not only targeting at concerts, they also had like places where you could walk around a virtual club and have different halls. There, there was someone here playing and someone there playing. And I'm I'm not sure if I remember correctly that you could also like buy digital drugs that kind of changed your perception, like uh, visually or or sound wise, so you could could really uh, experience stuff differently. So this was like. Uh, even more interesting than reality. And that was definitely where, where I say, and the, the Waves VR, uh, at least at that time, I think was uh, was based on Unity or, or Unreal Engine, but they, they were, do everything with, with game engines. And I think that's that's a perfect connection. I mean, you see it with like the American weather reports where they have like mm. storm or water going up. I think that was in the media um years ago and i think the the game engine and that why they are being funded so heavily with multi-millions of dollars is that that you can do not even games with it and also like artistic stuff but in the end you always need a developer and many developers for this as, as Shirley knows and it's uh it's still quite expensive um to have uh, a lot of developers so 
that's uh, I think that's the only limiting factor I would say everything else you can do whatever you want mm -hmm. on the music side or entertainment side uh, Christian you are uh, if I can summarize it like this on the audio mm -hmm. side of immersion and uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to um, virtual reality and people think about virtual re reality often they say oh I can touch new worlds do you think people already pay enough attention to audio or is it maybe the case that uh, the development is more concentrated on the video side and it's more important to now have also audio startups and you that will also bring uh, the the audio side into the immersion and maybe also to connect that to haptics because in mm. my mind it's it's too much limited to to the visual aspect mm. yeah i mean that's Definitely what we experienced uh, like on the VR meetups uh, where I've been in 2014, 2015, uh, when I was speaking about audio VR or immersive audio, all the all other companies were just games and visual focused and they were just doing stuff and I had to explain it to them doing panels. And But uh, after a time, I think the, um, the knowledge that 3D audio is not only beneficial, but also needed for VR. Uh, totally helped the the acceptance for audio and and I think uh, in, in the latest moment when Oculus and others said well audio not only helps the immersion it al also can guide your attention so if you hear the sound from there you look there and then you uh, then you have the user's attention that's even better than visual visuals because you can't see uh, behind you so uh, b besides the aesthetic approach with immersive audio and immersion uh, the, the the approach to really guide the, um, the user's attention is is very important, and that's what people definitely understood over the last years. But it's it's a lot of work, and in the end, it's uh, I, I studied sound engineering, also did some sound for video stuff, where you always experience audio last. That was our our joke sentence. Also, <laughs> my co-founder Achim Thomas that you met, he he uh, used to work also uh, for for many years in the film industry, and it's always. Uh, the the budget is being cut there, the time is being cut. If the editing takes longer, then the sound design has to be shorter and uh, less less days to do that. And for this is definitely somehow similar depending on the productions. And I think it's the same in the film world as in the game or VR world. If you have a director or producer who knows how important audio is, and I mean, in the film world, there are that many directors over the last decades that knew that. And in the VR world, you also have a lot of them that know how important sound can be. So it's it depends a little bit, but I, I would say it's the 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 knowing of 3D audio for VR is definitely growing. Yeah, and when it comes to podcasts and also Clubhouse, people um, pay attention to audio, but maybe not in the moment, not in the quality at that large scale. But it gets better and better. And Matthias Röhler made a comment on that. Um, he mm -hmm. told, um, yeah, platforms like Clubhouse, it seems to be, are like a lost opportunity for immersive audio. It is pretty lo-fi, no spatialization, etc. What needs to happen so they jump on cutting edge audio? Hmm. Um, what do you think? I, 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 when I heard about Clubhouse, I was, and I heard about the name audio social media, I was directly, wow, that's it, finally. <laughs> um, but, but of course, I mean, in the end, it's all about bandwidth. It's, it's all about, yeah, it, primary bandwidth. And I mean, for immersive audio, you usually need um, a better bandwidth. Of course, the processing could be done within the smartphone and these things, but then you need processing power. So I think it's, it's definitely interesting to to implement that, but uh, in the end, I mean, people are happy that they at least can hear stuff if the Bluetooth stuff is connected or not. So then, even there, immersive audio takes a little bit, but it totally makes sense to have like uh, immersive audio features or at least binaural uh, positioning of the speakers on the stage um, in 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 those tools. And I think that's that's totally helpful. But I mean, you can also see it with tools like Zoom. I think in our pre-call we talked about that uh, that uh, for example last year I, I did a webinar on uh, binaural music production and it yeah it took some time to get stereo uh, activated in zoom and when you have it activated then you find out that many bluetooth headsets deactivate stereo mode if you have the microphone activated and uh, and yeah. then then it worked out fine but uh, in the end the recording in zoom was mono then so it's it always fights against these um approaches where you need at least stereo in the immersive audio world but i totally agree that immersive audio for 
social or 3D audio social media, I think that's that's definitely the next step if you look at Clubhouse. It's By fascinating the way, you were mentioning the, the audio. Oh, sorry. I was about to say it's fascinating that this technology of binaural audio is not a new thing. We had it since the 70s, and mm -hmm. I feel like we're always going backwards. It's like we already have immersive sound, we already have 360 audio. But no, let's go back to stereo. No, no, let's go back to mono. This is simple. Mm -hmm. This is like, and it's always like, you know, taking musicians a step back. I think that what actually needs to happen is more people need to advocate towards this because, yes great it's it's you know i'm seeing films and i'm seeing how they're mixed and 5.1 7.1 i'm like but we have ambisonics you don't need to think about how many speakers you have you can just move sounds around <laughs> this technology is not only already here we already know how to use it mm -hmm. um so yeah. for me it's a matter of yeah. musicians not being shy and not saying oh no we only need like two kilobytes on the computer it's like just push forward and it will happen Def um, definitely I, I i totally agree that that now the the bandwidth is growing and and also i mean binaural music is is definitely growing there there are a lot of productions coming up it it had like a kind of hype name i guess surely last year when 8d music came up which is oh, more a hype. Yeah. it's more a hype name but in the end it's just binaural music and there, there we, we see it from the requests for our tools. Uh, there, there's a lot of music production going on in these fields. And also uh, what, what we just uh, showed in our blog is uh, immersive audio podcasts are growing pretty much. And that's where I'm very happy at. Uh, at least then you also need stereo and it's a little bit bigger, the, the podcast files, but there's a lot uh, binaural podcasts coming up even in the American uh, podcast scene. Uh, in Germany, we had radio plays also in the 70s with dummy heads and then it vanished for decades, but now it's coming back. And this is uh, an evolution we yeah, totally appreciate and are happy that it's finally there. And uh, actually, we can now test out if this streaming service provides a good stereo and binaural <laughs> um, picture in our minds, because um, we've we prepared a video which explains a bit what you are doing, but later on we, you can explain it also if it did not work, because uh, that's a video that requires you to have two different channels. So Nikolai, please play the next video. Put on your headphones and take the next step into immersive 3D It's audio. unfortunately mono for me. How about you? So the- I can't say for sure on the mono video. Uh, yeah. Uh, so maybe it's better to share the link of that video for, for the audience, because uh, you, yeah. you, you, would, you would already hear now that the source uh, put on the headphones should already start from the right side. So maybe we will uh, definitely share that or maybe uh, I will post it below the video uh, on YouTube. Uh, but maybe we can look at the, the other video uh, where... Yeah, because we that, can look at the other video. That, that's our rendering engine that you should have heard if stereo would be possible <laughs> with the tool. Uh, but the other video is a, is a video where you're able to... Yeah, let's take a look at it. Imagine you could visualize and control the mix all around you. To work in VR, AR, 360 video or even stereo with a unique tool. This has never been done before and it has become an absolutely revolutionary workflow now. But with Gear VR Spatial Connect, you just leave your headset on. You can control the complete digital audio workstation there. Media has changed to become immersive. So mixing audio has to become immersive and more intuitive too. That's why we created the mixing console of the future. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's a tool basically uh, not only that does the processing, that's the other video that we might share, um, but this is a tool uh, where, where we found out, as I already said, like 3D audio or immersive audio production was a little bit wild west over 2015, 2016. Uh, and we first created uh, this engine, this binary rendering engine, but then we found out uh, the perfect technology is nothing without the tools to apply it. Uh, and then we found out when we did, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, we, we did like content creation, like VR games, sound design and productions, prototypes. And on the other side, we create a tool. And when, when we did like productions, 360 video productions or VR mixes, there was always Achim with a VR headset on saying, oh, well, can you make track one, two dBs louder? Uh, can you move it there? Oh, now we have to restart again. And if it's in, in Unity in a game engine, you have to play the game from the beginning and, and everything. So that was, that was horrible. And th then we realized, okay, we really need a tool that enables you to uh, do the content creation within the media itself. And th th that's Spatial Connect, what I already You've seen me in the in the video uh, where where we find out that not only uh, experiencing VR is important, but also the tools for VR creation is important, and that that was our approach with Spatial Connect and or also upcoming tools that we're working on uh, that show pretty much what we're doing at Dear Reality. That is. Have you two actually to already worked together to to offer the services to to the other person? Not yet, th but there might be some things. You should, you should. In the recent years um, at Kyle Music Tech Conference, people found each other and they they uh, created projects, companies together. It's, it's really amazing. Yeah, definitely. And Same I mean, the, thing the, that the, comes up your mind. <laughs> Uh, definitely, I mean the 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 fun. Definitely, I think spatialization is is important. Uh, I guess, or you might already use it uh, within your experience to localize uh, the sound from the right well, direction. We're using some. We're using the native uh, system mm -hmm. within the engine, so it's very mm -hmm. uh, basic. But what okay. I love about your tool is, I am a high advocate for. When you're working in VR, work in VR. See the mm -hmm. space in 360. It's always funny to me to see, you know, architects working on like a 2D, like 2D screen with a 3D model that they can barely see. And I said, just go yeah. in the headset and just move around, see and feel it, uh, which gives you like a different sense of how the users are gonna see and feel it. So yeah. um, this is fantastic work. And if you have a Thank demo, you. I would like to have it and play around with this. I think that you showed their Reaper. So this is the way that I'm spatializing things now, just like sitting with like a little cursor and moving yeah, yeah. around. So, totally. But exactly what you just said on the visual side, again, visual first, everything was already there uh, at that time. I mean, like car manufacturers are designing their stuff in VR and you could like create game worlds in VR. And that was also part of our pitch deck uh, years ago where we said, okay, on the visual side, everything is there, but on the audio side, not. And that was, yeah, definitely like for us, uh, the missing link to really be able to to mix stuff in VR. But I mean, of course, then came AR and uh, these are new approaches that, that we're currently tackling. So I think there's, yeah, in the future, there will be a lot of new tools coming up that, that are needed, not only from us, but other companies to, yeah, make the workflows more accessible and not so clumsy as Shirley just said, sitting there with the mouse and, uh, doing stuff, I, yeah. I remember meeting with uh, some people from YouTube and telling them how much their algorithm is bad for ambisonics recording. It's basically compressing the audio to less than an MP3. Um, mm -hmm. I said, why? Why are you doing this? We have the technology to do this. Just let us um, publish our videos. And basically the answer that I got is that there are not enough videos and there are not enough of views on those videos for them mm -hmm. to even consider that as a feature. So again, if you guys are watching this and you are creators, please take this opportunity because this is a brand new world and tools are being created all the time to make it so much easier to just release your content in 360 and be a part of it. And are you all also hiring uh, you two? Uh, not currently. But people yeah. will find out on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, no, no, we're, we're definitely uh, yeah hiring uh, usually developers, but but also working with with musicians, uh, sound designers that use our tools, 
uh, for demos for stuff. So uh, yeah, I think it's super helpful to have like huge ne networks through my sound engineering studies, but also like the uh, Sonophilia and Karyan uh, people from Matthias to 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 know a lot of people that that are doing this stuff. So yeah. Uh, we're looking if for more could, partnerships. Oh, so. sorry. Uh, I was about to uh, say, the reason I'm sometimes interrupting is uh, because I'm, I'm like I'm speaking into a wall because sometimes I don't, I don't hear anything and I just I'm just guessing when a person ends to speak. So it's like uh, I'm today like like an actor that uh, that plays a moderator because I have some connectivity issues. <laughs> but in total, it was quite okay. <laughs> But, but continue, please. Oh, uh, I was about to say, uh, unfortunately, we're still not hiring, uh, but we are looking for partnerships and for how to expand our software to more uh, users and more artists that are going to be working on it. I think that Christian and I have something in common where we want to facilitate more art and creation in general for everyone uh, and to just make it easier and more approachable for everyone to use those tools in the future. Absolutely. That's, that's, I mean, uh, so sometimes people say, well, we're still at the beginning. Uh, and then I think, well, that's just the beginning. It already took so long to get here. But I, I also wonder uh, pretty often what tools uh, and what content we will have in, in the next seven years. Um, so I think this is definitely, there's a lot of, a lot of space to, to create tools and apps, as you said, Shirley. Uh, there, there's a lot of content missing or I mean there, there are like these killer VR apps like Beat Saber but I mean uh, there's enough space for classic Beat Saber and these things what uh, what, what you're working on and so this is uh, definitely a very interesting space that we yeah, want to support absolutely. Be, be, besides um, collaborations and maybe um, people you want to hire, um, what are the biggest bottlenecks in the industry in the moment? So what are things we have to overcome, for example, bandwidth, um, finding finding coders to both enable virtual studios project, but projects, but also dear reality projects. So what is needed right now? What are the action steps? Um, question Less to me. Upgrades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um yeah i think uh two two years ago three years ago i would have said yeah more funding that that the investors become more um yeah brave to say okay it's still starting and some vr startups didn't succeed yet but there are some unicorns uh so i think the the braveness to invest there but that's definitely growing i think also with Tools like uh, Pokemon AR, we all know this, uh, the investment in, in the immersive, especially in this case, AR world, augmented audio uh, reality world has grown pretty much. But that that was for us like three years ago, really the, the bottleneck. And and I think for now, it's definitely getting getting the right people, getting in, into the, the, the right connections to to start with, with the tools that you have. I think this is for us uh, the biggest uh, thing. And of course, reach reach new users that haven't used the tools and do a lot of education. I think that's what, what I do for the last five, six years is educating people about 3D audio, how to use it for someone who never used it, someone already used an audio workstation, someone never. And then then you have to explain them how to yeah do, do workflows with binaural, ambisonics, multi-channel, this stuff. I think this is summing up the biggest bottleneck is the, the education uh, and train people to really yeah, get into mm. immersive audio productions to create great content and uh, experiences. Shirley, do you want to add something? Um, I think for us, the biggest challenge was um, that the technology changes every two days. So new headsets are coming up. The new headsets are not supportive of the old headsets. You can't really upgrade your softwares very easily. And it's just a matter of a huge learning curve whenever something new is coming out to the market. Uh, but I do think that it's going to stabilize soon. It's already like getting into a point where it's stable. Um, and everything Christian said, I completely agree with that. It's, it's, it's getting there and it's just a matter of putting it in the hands of people as much as possible. Thank you so much, Shirley Spikes and Kristen Sanders for being our guests tonight.
A big round of applause for you today Thank from Dresden and you. hopefully <laughs> everywhere around the world. But the program is not over, not just do we have another three days of the Kali Music Tech conferences, uh, Conference. Also today we're going to have a lot of more program. Now, in an, uh, on the same channel, on the YouTube channel of the Kali Music Tech Conference and on the YouTube channel of the Kali Institute, you're going to see a performance by Filippo Gorini. And it's happening in a few minutes. It, the, the stream will be interrupted, but it starts new. And on 7 p.m. for our Brain Trust members, you're going to see other members of the Brain Trust in, in a little happy hour where we are having. The unconferencing part starts officially today. Watch out what we will po be posting on Slack and get around. It will be fun. Uh, thank you for attending the conference day two. Another three great days lie ahead. Thank you. Thank you.